Welcome to Pop and Lock. I am Natalie Dazicki. Landry, bring yourself back online. Is this real? Is this now? Freeze all motor functions. Today we are going to talk about the exclusive theme park where those who have money to burn can live without limits. Delos Inc. has created the ultimate experience where guests can interact with human-like AI droids who are programmed to fill every guest's desires. What could possibly go wrong in Westworld? With us today is Senior Editor at Reason, Elizabeth Nolan Brown. Hi. And Features Editor at Reason and co-host of the Across the Movie Aisle podcast, Peter Sunderman. Hello. First, have you ever questioned the nature of your reality? <laughs> Is that a question for me? <laughs> yeah. I think it's a great place to start. To. <laughs> but uh, what makes Westworld so great or not great if you feel that way? Why do you like this show? So I, I like the show a lot. I am, I, I'm not sure I would call it great. Uh, I find it tantalizing and interesting and also very frustrating at times, in part because I am constantly questioning the nature of its reality. And the show withholds so much information from you in a way that's not, it's not even clear what information it's withholding. And so a big thing about this show is that uh, it has not just a naughty timeline that is often sort of the show is sort of splitting up timelines and, and you're never quite clear on which one you, you're you in. And in the first season, of course, this turns out to be a big reveal, which is that Dolores re, uh, un, finally understands that the man in black and the, the young man who she'd been interacting with um, much earlier in her life as an AI uh, park bot uh, are both the same person. And so that uh, there's actually sort of there's a narrative device uh, at you know, that is behind that. But the show doesn't really tell us when it's set or what the outside world is like or uh, whether it's set in something that's essentially our reality or something else. And there's always this sort of ambiguity, this vagueness where you it, it sort of spawns not just like one or two or three theories that are like here are how all the puzzle pieces could fit. But you have to do a lot of almost um, almost like kind of fan fiction uh, speculation about what's really going on in this show, whether the whole thing is just sort of a series of nested simulated worlds, whether everyone has been uploaded, whether this is where whether we're all, you know, the the, uh, the second season raises the possibility of copying your consciousness and putting it into uh, putting it into one of the uh, one one of the robots and so the show does is is in many ways it's uh, very interesting in asking a bunch of these questions about how reality works, how um, whether people are have free will or whether robots have free will, what free will is, what it means to be a person or an individual uh, and to make choices. And yet it also just kind of drives me nuts all the time <laughs> in, in its absolute refusal to answer really basic questions about what's going on with the plot and why people are doing things and where and when that, we are. That part that you mentioned, though, I mean, I I think it's interesting that it does make you question the nature of your own reality, I think. I mean, for me, it, it, I don't know. I mean, I don't mean it in a necessarily really serious way, but, um, you know, especially during the first season, you know, they introduced the concept of the loops and these part of the way they, they program, you know, the robots in the park and part of the way they end up sort of gaining, um, you know, consciousness or sentience over time is, you know, by just repeating these same sort of actions. They're on their loops. They have their core drive and they have their, you know, functions that they do every day. And like you start watching that, you start, you know, I started walking to work every morning to think of this as of like my loop. And like, I'm literally just, you know, just in the same way that Dolores was in Westworld going to the market. Like, you know, it's just like you do get on your loops. And the first season started right as um, I think it started in 2016. Did the show start in 2016? Yeah. 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 And so it started during the, um, you know, a particularly crazy time in American politics and public life in just general. And everybody was sort of joking and started joking about the simulation and, you know, the simulation malfunctioning. That kind of became like, you know, a, a pop culture sort of meme at the same time as as Westworld was on. So it was kind of interesting. It did make you it did, you know, kind of all come together and make you think about that. Yeah, and like, I, I'm a fan of the show and I enjoy watching the show, like uh, like Peter said. But at the same time, I also felt like in order to enjoy this show, I had to put like a lot of homework into it. Like I wanted to know what all different theories everyone had based on like the timelines or who... And, if you are unfamiliar with the show, a lot of the characters have multiple names, have have died and come back as different people or their consciousness is put into a different body. Um, so a lot of that, I wanted to make sure I had all of the information. So I felt like I was watching correctly. Like, I don't know. There were some times where like, am I watching this correctly or am I like totally missing it? It's got a kind of Lost vibe. And I, I didn't watch yes. Lost. So I was like really frustrated by Lost fans. But I feel like now I'm that person with this show. I'm in the exact same boat. I never saw Lost. But every time someone sort of starts to describe the like struggle 
and intense the challenging nature of enjoying Westworld like I do, which is I think it, it it's not a satisfying show in a clean <laughs> way, yeah. but I enjoy the slog of it. Um much like kind of like like grinding in They're a video game. They're not putting game. that on the uh, the DVD. <laughs> right? that's, I that's enjoy not the, the pull slog. Quote. Of it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's a puzzle. Yeah, it's always a puzzle, yeah. and you, yeah, yeah. It's like grinding in a video game or something. Like it's, I'm fighting against it, and I'm having fun. And even when I reach a certain point and I've accomplished something, it really just opens up more possibilities yes. and and doesn't doesn't give me a satisfying answer but i still enjoyed the process the game uh, the show i should say is really driven by video game logic uh in i mean i don't know so i i know it, uh you're a, a bit of a gamer um i play a bunch of uh, big open world video games and the show really draws a lot from uh that style of play where you are where you have a a sing, where you're playing a kind of single player either you're an unnamed yourself avatar or you are sometimes playing a a character who is scripted and who has lines that you either control or in some cases don't um, but you you're interacting with this big open world filled with non-player characters who are you know like the hosts in this show um, and it's kind of interesting the way uh, I, I in some ways I think Westworld is the most successful video game show or movie ever made even though it's not actually based on a on a video game um, just in that it seems to kind of capture that in a in a dramatic uh, way, in a, in a sort of in a way that's uh, in a scripted uh, sense, uh, better than actually a lot of of uh, movies that are just straightforwardly based on video games. We're gonna do Sonic the Hedgehog next. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're not. <laughs> Another thing that kind of really stuck out to me about the show, especially in season one, was that. The I guess the show creators all assume that once there's like no rules and you can pay as much money as you want to get into this world, that you're ultimately going to be super violent. Um, and that like the oh, like especially towards the beginning, that um, a lot of the guests we saw enter, they were like, oh, you can shoot whoever they don't care. Like, I'm just wondering why they made that choice, because like even if I went into a world like this, the first thing isn't. I would think of like when there's like no rules, so to speak, is, oh, yeah, like I'm just going to go shoot the hosts. Here again, I think the video game logic really applies yeah. because you do see this in video games that have big, big open worlds and that, that where they don't require you to do something. You're just sort of I mean, you can go on sort of specific and certain quests and you can engage with a story, but you can also just sort of wander from town to town or village to village, depending on the, the type of game. And in some of those games, you have the option to kill literally every character right. in the game. Even even characters that are nominally quite important to the story and people do that. On the other hand, you also see in many of those games uh, a, a big challenge that players uh, will will make for themselves is to play the game with kill, uh, killing no one. And this is a big thing in the gaming community is that there are a lot of people who are like, let's take a game that's kind of inherently violent where there's where the idea of violence is built into the game and let's avoid that entirely and see if we can still beat the game. And Westworld does a, a less good job of engaging with that impulse. I mean, especially in the, in the beginning of the season, we do see a lot of people uh, just like tangentially that are in there to just sort of do other things. But right. I think also, I mean, we're s supposed to understand it, even though the park's been open for 30 years, that it's still s s sort of expensive thing, that it's still sort of a luxury trip and a, a very specialized vacation or, you know, maybe in space or something. We don't even know. But, um, you know, somewhere sort of remote. It's not um... in space. <laughs> that would be an awesome. That is the honest. worst theory. And... We're going to say that okay, sound so... bite and we're going to prove you wrong someday. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> So, you know, you have to have a lot of money, and I feel like you have to have a lot of strong desire to get there, so that might attract a certain sort of people, too. Like, people who are more likely to want to go there so they can, like, murder and rape and pillage, Rebellious. as opposed to just, like, I could go to an amusement park and, like, play a game, you know, where they could maybe just take a less expensive vacation for to do that. Uh, Jesse Walker, our colleague, actually does some interesting, uh, has done some interesting writing, though, on uh, crises um, and when social order breaks down. And, you know, you see a lot, you see this a lot in movies where it's like, oh, the government has gone away, there's no social order, right? There's been a, a catastrophe or an apocalypse, and suddenly everybody goes nuts, right. and there's riots, and they just murder everywhere, suddenly and stealing it's stuff. The purge. And in fact, what Jesse what Jesse makes a pretty uh, good argument, um, pretty convincing to my mind, is that for the most part, more often than not, 
social order develops without rules and that people end up looking after a crisis. They look to help themselves. And frankly, I grew up in the state of Florida where there were hurricanes every year. And what happened after a hurricane and everybody lost a bunch of property and there were trees falling you know, that had fallen, fallen down you know, onto people's houses and on broken cars. People didn't go around like stealing from each, from each other. Instead, they walked around and the guys who had chainsaws would help each other out. And, you know, and like you would go to your neighbors and rake their yard, you know, and that sort of and like social order does develop and people don't always just sort of uh, just sort of say, oh, here's an opportunity to break all the rules and be horrible to everybody around me. Right. And I think that's like a really important because the social order element, it seems to be almost missing from the show. But as Elizabeth pointed out, those who are fortunate enough to be able to afford this experience maybe are going there because there is no social order. And they think that um, it like even elevates their status. Um, mind you, we don't know what the world outside looks like. So we don't know if they come back and brag to all their friends that they're they had this great out of this world or out of body experience, whatever, whatever it may be. Um, so I just I, I guess I just thought it was interesting that it w- they always assumed violence um, would be something everyone would jump to first. There is an element of cynicism about human nature, certainly inherent in the show. And I think it goes beyond just the indulging in our, our darkest desires that seemingly happens very commonly in the worlds of of West. Um, uh, I think it also – it comes to fruition and is really like distilled uh, towards the end of season two in something that you also brought up, Elizabeth, when you mentioned the loops in human nature. When the, the forge is personified as the Logan, Delos' son, mm-hmm. and he is going through and distinctly says there really is no difference between humans and the hosts because we're all following – algorithmic loops and going about our lives in the same way. Do you think that that is a flaw in the show and that perhaps a more optimistic or hopeful outlook would be uh, something that could help benefit it? Or uh, what, what do you make of that? Well, I, mean, I think I like that part. And, you know, he's, yeah, he shows in the books and he's like, you know, human's code is really simple, but he's, you know, referring to like the DNA and, you know, he's sort of just, um, and I think, I think that part is kind of cool and I don't think that that's necessarily pessimistic, but I do think I do think that's separate from what you were saying before about like they just have a really negative view of human nature in general. And I think I don't like that. Yeah. I mean, I think it could benefit from a little bit more of a character who's otherwise. We get glimpses of that, like at the end of the second season when there's the screenwriter for the theme park who's just been kind of this cowardly, like bad guy the whole time. And then, you know, he ends up sort of uh, making a big heroic gesture to help save and sacrificing himself at the end. And I mean, we do get glimpses of that, but. Yeah. Isn't that cynicism partly because the show is told, if it is told from a specific perspective, it's from the perspective of the hosts yeah. who have been effectively enslaved by humans. And so in some ways, the show adopts their perspective and their view of human nature. Right, which is that that's really rare. Like for them, it's actually really rare to have a host be, I mean, to have a human be, you know, sacrificing themselves or even going out of their way at all to, to do something for a host because that's not, but so that's all they see, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I think I agree with Elizabeth in the sense that generally there's a cynicism towards human nature throughout the show. But I think like more specifically, the loop example was almost something that made the show relatable. So like we could, like Elizabeth was saying, like she goes to the market and she like finds herself on a loop and a lot of us have loops or have, these organized schedules that we tend to from week to week. So I think that made the show relatable and almost not that the show is like incredibly unrealistic. Like we have, we have AI that works and like all that kind of stuff. But I think elements like that made it seem a bit more tangible. Like, Oh, we might be talking in a world that's like semi similar to this yeah. one. You know what I mean? Cause they, they needed to have like little Easter eggs in here or there that like brought us back to, Oh, this is like maybe tangentially right. related to our and world. It, it makes you put, it puts you in the place of the, the host too. Like instead of just being like, Oh, could this happen? Do we have this technology to make this other thing? It, it makes you think like how close am I to this other thing? I think more right. so than, yeah. I think that's also an interesting element because we're relating to a robot. Not a not a human in the show. Yeah, you definitely relate is, more to. I mean, I I feel like I relate more. To, I think they want you to relate more to the robots than the humans. Yeah, it's it's a show about questioning what makes someone yeah. human, what makes them uh, sentient, what makes yeah. them what a makes moral a moral being, uh, right? A, a moral being and a person in a lot of ways. And one of the tricks it pull pulls is to make us 
sympathize, uh, empathize, feel more uh, in co- feel more connection to the hosts than to the actual human characters in many cases, uh, and to give the the hosts and the humans. Um, uh, overlapping and and similar traits in some ways, so that we can, so that it sort of collapses the difference between them. Because yeah, they also toy with you with the robots too. I mean, there's the while I think season two sort of sets up where really, especially at the beginning, that the, the hosts are maybe superior to humans. I mean, especially Dolores, you know, is just kind of coming out right and saying that all the time because she's had all this experience with them. But then at the end, I mean, she ends up the big conflict between her and Teddy, her you know boyfriend turned, I don't know, robot killing person whose brain she warps um but you know when when he doesn't like who she made him he doesn't like who she's become she's sort of indiscriminately killing people at the end and he's like you know we don't want to you know take over this world just to become the same as them and i think it does it gives you that too yeah and i think one of my bigger questions is what was the purpose behind westworld and i guess that delves from the fact that i don't necessarily understand the world they're in um so I was thinking, because in the first season, it's hinted at largely that Westworld is a business venture, right? Like, just a part. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. It's a business venture. They're going to make a lot of money. And then in the second season, we get more... I got more of the sense that Westworld is a scientific experiment that they're also making a lot of money off of by inviting guests in. Yeah, it's it's secretive and sort of clandestinely collecting data on all of the park guests via their interactions and observation and also via their hats via the hats yeah. which was a very subtle reveal yeah. towards the end that i was kind of like okay i think Can i get gloss it over that a little bit yeah, yeah. and it, and it seemed a little for a west world reveal it seemed a little too simple it for me like it did it just kind of was like by the way if you wear a hat we're getting stuff from you and i was like oh okay well then well wasn't it in season two they like did the little nod and he like pointed to his hat but wasn't it in the first season pretty early on when um one of the original like perfect female droids was walking young william through like the prep guest yeah. prep center she was like oh pick any hat you want and they like really emphasized that scene though i didn't when i was watching it i was like oh he's just getting a costume like, well in, in, like, that, in that scene it's a choice between a black hat and a white yeah. hat yes. and so it's the idea of cho- choosing whether you're going to be a a good uh cowboy or you're going to be a bad cowboy in cowboy world and um and here you know the this is we talked about video games already but the show also draws a lot from our experience with social media and the idea that uh you know in some ways facebook might be drawing for example it might be making a huge amount of money off of just selling ads or you know taking a cut of whatever the stuff you're selling is uh, on set on on facebook marketplace but in fact the actual money maker off of off of facebook is taking your data and then figuring out what to, figuring out a lot of stuff about you building profiles um and selling that and using that to do whatever else can be done with that. And so the show does do an interesting... No, I'm not sure it's always completely successful. Watching but it's the, an interesting kind of collage of fears about technology. I was going to say, watching it again, um, I was you know rewatching b- big parts of the second season again, though, and that, that stuff really just jumped out at me again. And I, like I, More and more, I think that that's a big... Or at least maybe it's just a theme that really interests me throughout. But I mean, it really, I love the way they set it up the first season. Like you said, though, it's just supposed to be like, this is a theme park. Robots are cool. AI, you know, I mean, that's a, that's its own sci-fi thing. You know, you've got AI, you can come here and play with it. What would humans do with that? Whatever. Um, and then we're, you know, we're, we're making money off of that. People indulging their base desires, what we're talking about. And then on the second season, it just flips it on its head. And it's like, that's not actually, that's just, that's like, that's the smoke and mirrors. That's the mirage. And it's, it, it's a fun, it's a really fun allegory for like social media at large or the internet. I mean, we have created this place with the social media where people can come and they can try on different identities. They can be anybody they want to be. There doesn't actually seem like totally like real consequences and stuff. I mean, and it seems very much like the span of art. And then all of a sudden it's just like everybody's like, oh, whoa, actually, like, you know, this wasn't the, the real point all along. The real point was this other secret stuff. And so, yeah, the end of the second season really inverts the idea in the first season that you can make a choice and the 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 hat sequence is about you can choose who you want to be which is of course a big thing in video games which is a big part of you know oh you're online you know nobody knows you're a dog right Right. online you can be (laughs) anything you want to be and and then the and then what season two does at the end is say in fact 
you, those choices didn't matter. Yeah, we've been watching the real you all along. <laughs> right, and there's these, I mean, like, they they highlight this explicitly. There's there's actual dialogue about this, right? Uh, you have the, the older version of, of William, the man in black, What say things like, what is a person but a collection of choices? Uh, you know, were any of these choices ever truly mine to begin with? And then you have uh, Dolores say to, um, uh, to the James Marsden character, uh, we'll be the first people in this world to make a real choice. And that's after she has kind of run through her revolutionary, you know, sort of murder spree throughout the the world and and is about to get to the the end goal and accomplish, you know, sort of what she wants to take over is is that she thinks that she will be free because of her choices. And the show is in some ways saying, no, your choices don't matter. They don't make you free because they're not really choices to begin with. Can we delve more into that? What else has the show? Because this is all a larger discussion about free will, which is like it slaps you in the face in this show, right? They're heavy handed, but in a good way, at least I think. What other times did the show come up with, whether it be dialogue or characters like really questioning their free will? I know Bernard, um, who's really Arnold, has quite a few instances where when he's finding out that he is a host like is this a dream is this real am i real we get a lot of stuff like that what other scenarios did you see where free will really came into play I mean, right around that same sequence there's a there's a bit where uh the older man in black encounters what appears to be his daughter um who he is somewhat estra- estranged from and he simply refuses to believe that it's his daughter he thinks it's the guy who he has been kind of sparring with about what the park should be uh Hop- the hopkins character being the guy who thinks that this is a place to tell stories and uh and the man in black being thinking this is a place to harvest data on people and run experiments so that i can upload my consciousness and live forever um which is in fact uh, you know a kind of interesting divide in uh in the world of uh, of elite technology and storytelling, right? It's like some people are just there to tell stories and some people are like, nope, I am here to make a billion dollars so that I can, so that I can, my, you know, so that I can live forever or that my consciousness will live on. And you have the people like William who we had, I mean, who is kind of a character at the beginning who's like, I'm going to do this because I want to, you know, change the world and give people a chance to whatever. And then who becomes something different over time. Very Zuckerbergian uh, figure, <laughs> perhaps. I think... Well, William is obviously a very interesting character. And I think what I mean, the best scene is obviously after the very, very, very end of season two, the credits roll. And then we see William is actually in the experiment. I'm, I'm going to call it an experiment. The fidelity the test. Fidelity yeah. test um, that he had Delos doing earlier on, um, which, oh, my gosh, the the fan theories on this on this, like literally 20 second clip of the end of the season two is crazy. But I kind of want to what do we think about that experiment? Do you would you want to live forever? Would you go on this quest to destroy your life in hope of finding immortality? This actually reminds me of another conversation we had when we talked about Black Mirror and the the discussion about whether you would install uh, your consciousness in a cookie oh, and yeah. have that live on forever <laughs> and use yourself as this uh, digital servant. So that was the first thought I went to is, I you know, maybe... I, at first, I would be like, no, that's inhumane. I couldn't do that. Absolutely. But if you could create a really good life for yourself and take care of yourself, I mean, I think that's a little bit more optimistic and not quite so pes- – I don't think that would happen in the show Westworld, but I mean – I'm pro radical life extension and anti digital cookie slavery. On the on the free will uh, examples of free will mm-hmm. thing though, um, just to come back to that real quick, there was one that I was watching again today too that I thought was or this morning that I thought was interesting. Um, where you know the one group of robots led by Dolores or hosts wants to go and and burn it all down, and um, the other one led by Tandy Newton or uh, Maeve wants to just go and find her daughter and like live off in a cabin in the wilderness and just like be at peace and just like drop out of the outside world instead of like pushing back against what they see as this corruption and for a minute Dolores and her gang are about to stop them and be like no you have to come with us all of us have to be on the same side and then she says something about like if you're fighting for liberty then you have to like give me mine and then she stops and she lets her go her own way and I thought that was interesting because you know so many times in in causes and in, in real causes in the world you have people doing this but then saying you know if you're on the right side you have to be with us 100% and not letting people have not accepting that other people have their own free will and agency even if they're sort of the same as you in 
some fundamental ways. Or do they? <laughs> right. <laughs> or do they? That's like that question you could ask throughout the entire show is like, oh, sequence. Okay. Or do they? Or do they? <laughs> or are they? Yeah. Yeah. I guess, like, I thought Maeve was a very interesting character, um, particularly for those scenes. And also that she seemed like the most... I don't know if it's sentient or she seemed the most relatable to me, partially because she had this like very real experience that that many I'm not a parent, but many parents would obviously have of this like longing to like save her daughter. And like seems like she really feels like she has familial ties, even though technically it was like in a loop of a memory she remembered from like way back when. And they destroyed her and put her in a new in a new character. But I think. In a way, the one scene, um, Maeve is on the, in like the experiment room. She's on the counter, and um, I believe it's Ford talking to her. And Ford was like explaining to her how he, how she is the closest thing he's ever had to like a child or save, wanting to save a child. And he said how he sympathizes or, I don't know, sympathize is the right word, sympathizes with her because that was like her whole goal was to go after her daughter and save her daughter. And we can argue whether or not she was actually making those choices on her own because it was like also in her code, whether or not she was going to escape Westworld. But I thought that scene was really interesting, partially because it showed us that the droids and the humans had like very similar goals. And I thought, I mean, I interpreted it as um, Ford, like Westworld is his baby, not necessarily Maeve in particular, like Westworld, the thing is his baby and he's just trying to protect it. Um, but then it kind of brought it back to when Maeve is like, I just want to protect my child. And like, that was a very humane and like realistic thing for a droid to want instead of going off and being a killer robot, essentially. I mean, again, this is this is an example of the show making the robots more human than the people because the robots are uh, – they, can, they uh, care about individuals and they have recognizable human feelings about other individual uh, intelligences, whereas the, the – the lords of the uh, of the of the park, right? The the humans who rule it are not really concerned about the individuals who are uh, whether they're human or whether they are uh, robots. They are concerned mostly about themselves and about their big corporate creations. To get involved in this business at all, they probably left a little bit of their humanity behind in order to create this world. Where that's, that's certainly the, the man in black's uh, uh, trajectory is that he that he estranged himself from his daughter and lost his wife to to uh, as a result of his inability to care about his family. Mm -hmm. And then that spurs, I think, his whole turn, really, even after, while he was somewhat cruel and using hosts in a sort of way, that's, I believe, when his sort of the the series of killings of Maeve yeah. begin and sort of it, it represents this, like, switch flipping um to put it in a sort of robotic sense where it's that was that was a breaking point that caused him to devolve uh, into this sort of monstrosity villainous character i think we're also forgetting too that originally arnold didn't want to open the park because he realized that the original dolores droid got to a certain uh sentient value or a certain intelligence that she was in fact conscious um and that's a, a part I think gets forgotten a lot because he was like, we can't, we can't do this to them, to them as in the hosts. Um, but then Ford obviously went ahead and trudged forward with the plan and they opened to the park. But I think that was also something that gets forgotten in the show. That was like one of the more uh, humane times or where humanity came in and it gets kind of like bulldozed over um, for, like we said, corporate interests, um, the money at stake, that those kinds of things. Cause once they had, once they realized the technology they had, then they were like, OK, whatever we can do to get this up and running. And they stopped caring about all the hosts as beings. I don't think it comes down so much on the side of humanity per se is good or bad mm -hmm. and that humans, you know, across the board are as that they can't change. Like we don't see characters that are portrayed as good characters become bad. I mean, aside from, aside from really William, but then he's got that whole speech in the end of season two where he's like, actually, this darkness was inside me all along. And like, I thought that like, whatever. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't, I guess, I mean, maybe it's a little grapples with this question some, but you know, you have the people like It really um, asks Delos. the question of whether people right. can change. And right. it su suggests that at, at minimum, it's very hard. Yes. Uh, it's not as easy as, for example, taking a, an iPad and flipping your switches, right? Right. So right. that you're, <laughs> suddenly you're, you're smarter yeah. and more aggressive or, or whatever 
whatever it is, which you can do with the hosts. Which almost makes them more more perfect humans, right? <laughs> or that's that's what the show is trying to suggest, that by the end, the hosts are, in a sense, and Dolores, I think, even says something like this towards the end of season two, something about, like, her, she is more perfect than the human that she's fighting. She's talking about how they, like, purposely designed her to be perfect. And now the humans are, like, going back on, not going back on their word, but going back on their creation, which is, like, something we see in, like, a lot of sci-fi films. They, like, create, like, this, I think you had written this down. It's like Frankenstein. You create this thing that you then are like, oh, shoot, I did this. And they're like, now what? Like, now they're killer robots coming after us. I don't know if you guys have seen the movie Blade Runner, um, the Harrison Ford film from 1982. uh, The um, somewhat uh, oligarchical uh, ruler of the, uh, not ruler, but the uh, owner of the Tyrell Corporation, which makes the extremely human uh, robots who end up, of course, going on a robot revolt and killing their masters. You know, you're sensing a theme here. Right? He says he has this uh, really famous line, more human than human, right? That was our goal. Um, and both Blade Runner uh, and even more Westworld are, are, are really kind of retellings of the Frankenstein myth and the idea that the tools that we make, the creations that we uh, that we that we create are going to be amazing and we're and are going to be very impressive. And they're also going to turn on us and everywhere in Westworld, you see this not just uh, not just sort of explicit kind of Frankensteinism, which is that, oh, I created a life and then it came back to kill me. But just the idea that technology and tools and that all of the things that we use and we rely on and that we invent, they're all dangerous. And there's there's just this there's so much sort of danger built into technology and and so much uh, expectation that it's going to that it's going to turn on you and that you are going to be killed or ruined or made monstrous by it. Michael Crichton is kind of obsessed with this, though. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is the guy who also runs Jurassic Park. Right. Yeah, so, so Michael <laughs> Crichton, yeah. right. So just for, for listeners' purposes, Michael Crichton um, wrote uh, the original Westworld and was heavily involved with that. Which is a lot of fun, the that. movie. It's yeah. totally different yeah. vibe. It's but... very cheesy. And again, there's a, like, yeah. a notable reversal in the original Westworld. The man in black was the killer robot. And that was, yeah. he was, the man in black was the, played by Yul Brenner, was, was, um, Supremely creepy and awesome. Was, was super great. And if you've seen, say, things like Terminator 2, uh, with the T-1000, like the sort of super intense like robot walk that all comes from from Westworld. Westworld, is a, it's a kind of a cheesy movie yeah, in, in a yeah. lot of ways, but it really invented a lot of the modern cinematic language for how we think about uh, killer robots and robot revolts, which turn out to be like a, a thing that we have a lot of. We have a lot of like very, uh, very popular entertainments that, that deal with this from the Terminator movies to the Matrix to... I, Robot. But, yeah, but right? I'm like, legend. That, yeah, I mean, this, this really, I, I mean, this is a killer robot movie, but again, it's like the real thing it's it's like we're all so worried about killer robots and then it's like haha it was actually the humans who were yep, right. collecting all your data and your soul <laughs> like um so it's kind of i mean it flips the whole like be afraid of the killer robots on its head a little bit if you could go to a world that delos ran is it west world is it shogun world is it the raj or maybe there's one that we don't know about yet that you have sort of dreamed up where would you want to go? There are six of them, right? They hint I at think that six, six or seven is is mentioned at one point, yeah. but we don't know all of them. The Raj, Shogun, and Westworld are confirmed, and would, there's a few theories about some other ones. But I would go. Do you guys know the movie Midnight in Paris? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I I just want one like where uh, um it's a Woody Allen movie, and he uh, the who's the main guy um. Owen Wilson. Yeah, Owen sorry. Wilson. Owen Wilson. Yeah. I was about to say Matthew McConaughey. Owen Wilson. <laughs> I would uh, watch Matthew McConaughey <laughs> in Midnight in Paris. Owen Wilson ends up, um, you know, in, in 1920s um, Paris where like, but like a, kind of a, a, where everybody is there at once who was ever in 1920s Paris is just all there at once. And I would go to that. I want that to be a Westworld. I think I would go to the uh, the Roman world uh, that you see in the original Westworld movie. So the third act of the film, they end up running through a bunch of additional worlds at, right? So they like it kind of, you, they go into the guts, the machinery of the of the theme park, as as Yul Brenner is chasing uh, the protagonist, and it, it's just sort of like it's it's like this brief tour of the other worlds that we have started now to see in the in the series as well, and like an all day toga party where you can do anything you want it sounds kind of great to me. Like I I'm there for that for like a week of toga bacchanalia. Peter, all day toga party. Me just want to drink with Hemingway Bot. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I would even want to go, but 
part of me is because I it's like a warning story for William, right? William was like not on this Westworld train. He was like, oh, I'm not going to find myself here. Like this is kind of BS. Um, and then he like gets stuck in this world, loses his family outside and is like so invested in the adventure and like the mind games that he thinks Ford is playing on him that he wants to win. Um, so I'd be, I'd be a little hesitant about like getting stuck there and like losing myself in a sense, whether it's in 1920s or whether I'm sitting with Hemingway. Um, but Hemingway I, toga party. <laughs> the Hemingway toga party. Hemingway, Hemingway robot. <laughs> Hemingway robot toga party is the name of my band. Um, <laughs> Anyway, um, but I think if I had to pick, like, I don't even know. I don't. I See, I have trouble picking one. There's a few, like, I, you know, am kind of interested in Westworld because I, so I'm from Texas originally. But I don't, like, I never sort of considered myself, like, very, like, southern or anything until I left. And now I have this, like, mythic vision. I'm like, I'm from Texas. I'm a cowboy. I'm which I'm not. Texas. I am not at all. Now but you own snakeskin boots. And yeah, I do own boots now, <laughs> um, which I did not own until I left the state for many years. But there's a part of me that just wants to go around and say, Lawrence, anytime I can, like Ed Harris. <laughs> but, like, any of those worlds that they have – Seems a little like, a am I going to slip into some sort of darker desire there? Not even like concretely, but they all sort of, and I think this is definitely something the showrunners were trying to sort of hint at. Um, and it's a little heavy handed, but all of the worlds tend to be kind of like weird imperialist playgrounds we have like the expansion of the west and yeah. the villainization and of colonial ghost nation india. colonial india um even i guess shogun world a little bit less so but it still kind of plays on the like go to a foreign place and blend in with them so i always am kind of hesitant to like to dream up a place that i want to go maybe if it was like like dungeons and dragons world like and it's like <laughs> it's, and, but it's eyes. like well Sorry about it. But it's like it's it's a little bit leaning into that like, you know, hyper like Western Europe trope. But like if there's magic, like I mean, I can't pass that up. Game of Thrones worlds, basically. I'd be interested. It's varied enough that I'd go. To, so, Natalie, you, you mentioned this idea that uh, you you would worry you would get lost in it. Right. Like, if I – so, if I created this – think about it. If you're creating this world that's optimal for you to go hang out in, why would you ever want to leave? This is a thing that happens to people playing video games. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm, I'm only slightly exaggerating, but yeah. there's people who just sort of get completely lost in Grand Theft Auto V or EverQuest or Destiny 2 or these games. I mean, there are now games that are designed for you to play a thousand hours plus in the course of a year. Um, and that's crazy well, just right, a huge, just... i mean it, it's it really is you know we we've uh we, if you all are familiar with the old like weird uh second internet the second life right which was supposed to be the basically a graphical kind of community overlay on top of the internet it didn't work the way ex exactly it was promised but it was an interesting idea that has informed a lot of our uh sense of what the internet could and should be and the these big video game worlds do end up being that in some ways. I mean, Fortnite, you have people that now that are, they, they play, they go to play the game, but a lot of teenagers are just there to hang out with their friends. Yeah, it's really like a created social these communities. and communal experience. And, and in fact, that's, I mean, like in some ways, that's a good thing, but it's also, it's, it's something that really tempts people and lures people in and you, you can get, you can get trapped. But presumably most people who go to Westworld, like just come back. Okay. Just like the vast majority of like, Video gamers, you know, you would or think like it whoever, wouldn't be like, successful come, come and still okay. running if well, not. You presume that, but the man in black talks yeah. about at the end, right? Like his heart is is actually there, and that's where his real I life is. I think he's like the outlier. He's like the guy, you know, like the ones we're always saying, like, yes, yeah, some people get addicted to this or that or that, but that's it's this not the, it's not the technology; it's the underlying like person's flaws. Um, but. Sorry, just um, again with Midnight in Paris, but I mean, because it's sort of the same thing. People then, people can kind of pick these past worlds they go to in the end. It sort of really explores that. And so the person who's in 1920s Paris, which he thinks is the golden era, then she's like, what? Like, I want to go back to the Belle Epoque. And then they go back there and they're like, what? And they're like, they want to go back to the Roman times, actually, and stuff. And it's this idea that, like, you know, we we have this idea of golden, of golden eras, but, you know, they're never... Once you're anywhere, you get used to it. So I feel like with the parks and stuff, I mean, most people, it's like once you be were there long enough, it would become your ordinary, and then you would want to... You'd either go back to where you came from, or you'd develop a normal sort of community structure there. 
in, you as would opposed fall to just be into like, a yeah. loop. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you would fall into your own sort of normal, healthy loop if you're not someone like William. Who or just like couldn't would hack you? It. <laughs> Whoa. It's okay. Is this real? Here. Is this now? <laughs> <laughs> well, I also think too, like Landry was saying, a lot of I mean, we would create different worlds than they created, obviously, but I mean their their worlds have, like I hinted at earlier, like a lot of violence. I mean, if you think about it too, the robots are slaves. Um, and we didn't we didn't get into this yet, but um the in Westworld, I don't know if they showed it in other worlds um but in specifically in the one that's like set in cowboy west um west world west world um, the world of west the world of west i got it thank you they have these uh they have a madam who's mave and she's running a brothel yeah i guess that's the time period is brothel then um she's running a brothel and i thought a lot of those and you're i know elizabeth's gonna have opinions on this one <laughs> um, i thought a lot of those scenes were interesting because because the people didn't have or the women didn't have like the women hosts didn't have this sense of like oh i'm i'm being used they were like oh they were just here to make the guests happy and because they're on this loop um what were i'm very interested in what your thoughts on this uh, sex robot work <laughs> sex work for robots um i don't know i actually and I, if they're aware that they are sex i don't working robots think that their sort of situation is very much different than than in the other ones in westworld right because they're all just sort of given their yeah they're like pleasing humans sort of a thing like i mean they do it through sex and there's some people who are just there to be like Really shot again and again and like <laughs> yeah. some people who are there to like pour their drinks so i feel like i don't know i mean i feel like it's it's they all kind of have the same same sort of yeah, drive i think that's kind of you know that we want to you know legitimize that idea of and and that type of work so much that i think concept like conceiving of it differently is part of what kind of others sex workers in general but if you sort of i it seems you know a little odd to just be like oh they're you know it they're not like any or they're like any other host um but i i think that's that's the case too One i of mean the things that's interesting is the like the tension between the hosts of different like the different types of hosts like there's like yeah. there's the like hispanic villages and then there's the white villages and then there's the, the native american villages and you know they all uh, fight each other too so like within this like sort of you know colonialist or whatever sort of you know world you also then have like within that these i mean and it's just like you know the hispanic settlers and the native americans too. like there's this whole there's these whole clashes and the hosts are actually sort of you know racist <laughs> against each other too there's like um, different pecking orders yeah. that exist like in the different uh hosts let's say like communities or so to speak and they each have oh I mean, they're assigned a role. I'm going right. to say they each have a role, right. um, but the whole, obviously, the whole show, whole show is about how they didn't choose that right. so the they role are, they, they were, were given. All programmed to have yeah. these sort of old fashioned, I mean, like, or I guess recreate reality sort of um, alliances, but it was, it's interesting. Yeah, how this that goes to the, the imperialism idea, which is, you know, sort of uh, that the, the, the overclasses um, abuse the underclasses. And one of the ways they do that is by pitting them against each other and by not allowing them to kind of come together, uh, by, 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 uh, refusing to let them be intersectional. Um, right. <laughs> and, uh, uh, I, I think we the, need the, intersectional, this, right, robots. <laughs> intersectional robots, um, is Just definitely put it on a little poster. <laughs> yes. Uh, the, um, but the sex worker stuff is, is kind of interesting because it starts from the presumption that the robots who are, uh, who, who are assigned that role don't have choice. And so this is a big theme in your work, Liz, is that sex work is a consensual choice, and that's why we want to decriminalize and legalize it uh, and destigmatize it. But it is but it is understood to be uh, abusive because they are because they are programmed to do this. Um, they are programmed not to remember the abuse that uh, that that they receive, um, and because they have no real ability to do otherwise. And so, it, again, it goes to one of the show's big questions that it often underlines in ways that are kind of very obvious. Uh, but what is choice? Uh, how does choice define us? Can we make our own choices? Yeah, and I think kind of even if you're going off of that like uh, cons consent and choice idea, like opting in um, voluntarily, then you could make the argument that all of uh, we've already made this argument that all of the hosts are, are enslaved because none of them made the choices to be, you know, shot and then keep reincarnating or continue to throw your drink on someone forever for an everlasting <laughs> loop. Um <laughs> Which sounds absolutely terrible. That guy got that really got the, <laughs> yeah, really got the short end of the stick on this one. Um, right, robot sex trafficking.
trafficking is real in Westworld. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I just like to say that it all takes place in space because Peter hates that. That's the <laughs> worst theory. It doesn't happen in space. How do you know? Why would it happen in space? There's no reference to space, to other planets, to a kind of extra They say extra at the end she beams, she beams out the other world to another thing. She says something like, I beamed it out yeah, to a, they show that to big a light place thing. where no one could ever find but it. But that's information to satellites or something. Satellites not, where? Where no... do satellites reside, Peter? In space. And also, <laughs> somebody had to put that satellite there. So, like, if nobody can find that satellite, who put it there? It's not All right, so do you think? Do you guys think it, we're in a certain year? Because there are a lot of things I was looking at. Like people are trying to make like fake timelines where the years could kind of be. Well, I will say it was something that Peter mentioned earlier is like you have to do digging outside of the in-world uh, like information that you're given in the show. But there is like extra like behind like featurettes and things that the producers and showrunners have released in the world websites they've built that sort of get that's like a, there's like a delos website and there was a video that somebody uploaded that had clips from the show and one of them was tagged as like 2052 or something so people take all of these tiny little breadcrumbs and can like sort of arrange them but uh, what the thing that's interesting to me is that the one that I've sort of seen that a lot of people seem to be is more legitimate is that William and Logan and the sort of start of Westworld before Delos purchased it or whatever they did is uh, by that timeline is seemingly happening apparently right about now or within the next year or so. So it, it sort of suggests that we're already on the tracks. To Westworld, I I saw. I think I was probably looking at the same thing as that. I don't, I don't necessarily associate anything that happens in Westworld with certain years that I've lived through or we've lived through. Um, but I kind of find it funny that people try to be like, "Oh, this is this is definitely 2032." I was like, "How in the world do you know this?" That's um, gonna. <laughs> if we're gonna move into talking briefly about season three, I, some of the new trailers do sort of build across timelines and show. Like a, a there's like a data visualization of like historical events, and then there's like a, <laughs> Peter is shaking like his a, head right now. There's an event that they highlight called like the divergence and all this stuff, and I I don't know how it's gonna work out, but I I want there to be at least a slight bit more distance from the like right now like it started at 2030 even and i'll be like okay that's far enough away that i don't have to think but about the it park's right been now. going on for 30 years right. if it had started it, like we say that like 2016 was the year the park started like then we're still there is an old episode of star trek the next generation in which uh in the space? In, in, in which happens in space <laughs> unlike westworld or does Star's it in which <laughs> captain picard does goes it? into the holodeck which is a virtual reality room that can simulate any environment um and faces off against the holodeck's most interesting Interesting character Moriarty from the Sherlock Holmes series, who uh, who is more who is smarter than other holodeck characters and has sort of more self awareness. And Moriarty becomes aware that he is a character in a holodeck play, and then uses his intelligence to do something that holodeck characters shouldn't be able to do, which is he leaves the holodeck. And you see this, uh, you know. Uh, uh, the portal into the normal uh, Starship Enterprise uh, hallways appear in the middle of Moriarty's, you know, lair or whatever. And he walks through it and sort of it's like this huge triumph for AI. Um, and it's just like, how did this happen? What's going on? Has he gained a sort of has his self-awareness translated into some sort of corporeal or right, physical uh, change in his reality? And of course, the reveal at the end of the, that episode is that the starship enterprise aspect was just simulated in the holodeck just like everything else and what he'd done was trick the holodeck into trick everyone else into sh making you know thinking the holodeck that what the holodeck was showing them was the real enterprise they'd never left the holodeck they were on the holodeck the whole time i think that's what's going on with westworld we are going to find out that it is all one big simulation somehow or another and that all of these all all the different worlds both uh both the the park worlds, but also the stuff that is happening outside is all somehow or another in some sort of simulation and that even maybe even the people who are interacting with it don't know this and in, in, in some cases, but that everyone is in some sense uploaded that all, all the places and spaces and times are not real. And that's why the show refuses to give us any hard and solid clues about what is and isn't real is because none of it is.
I'm not going to make any expectations or predictions on the, the new season just because I really have no idea where they're going to take it. I've watched the trailers that they've put out and I'm just I'm going to be happier not having expectations. I, I, I I'm kind of with you. Like yeah. I'm, I'm curious, <laughs> but, but I I don't teasing it all out beforehand i want it to unfold in yeah. front of me and, and enjoy the process and then do all the background research for what i just watched to make sure i actually watch the same thing i thought i was watching it's about the journey not yeah. the destination yeah, i'm right. just in it for the really nice textures on the clothes like <laughs> I, and in fact this is one of the things that i re- that i do really love about this show is that it's about a place that may or may not be virtual but certainly is unreal in a sense and yet the physicality of this show is so incredible it just it looks beautiful but in particular all the stuff stuff in the show just has like a, a weight to it, a, 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 a textured thickness and even even stuff that isn't isn't physical stuff. Uh, you mentioned um, Ed Harris's voice. It's so great. In the, I mean, he just has a great voice. Right. <laughs> but in this show in particular, it goes out of its way to emphasize just the deep graveliness of being an old man who's like had his soul ripped. Like, I can't do it because I'm not Ed Harris and I don't have a super cool voice like he does. I hope that someday I'll get old enough and smoke enough cigarettes to, to get there. But um, but it really really just has like a a kind of a a physicality and a texture and a weight to it that I that I find very pleasurable to get lost in, even if the actual writing and storytelling on the show is sometimes frustrating. Yeah, and I think I think HBO and yes, we know that HBO spends lots and lots of money on, especially on Westworld and these shows. And I think they do pay particular attention that, um, and the costume designers pay particular attention to the way the show is filmed, as well as like the the costumes and the backdrops and all that kind of stuff. Which makes the music, the music, yeah, the music's really good in this show as well. Um, which makes it or this unreal world seem even realer. Um, and I think I, th- that's obviously intentional, right? Um, yeah. One thing you were talking about that sort of aligns both the, the sort of like textured and detailedness of the world and also Ed Harris's voice is I was watching a video, maybe we can link to it in the show notes, okay. uh, where Jonathan Nolan and Lisa Joy were breaking down some of the scenes in the fidelity test room with Delos mm-hmm. between both William and Ed Harris. And they talked about one of the, the like whiskey bottles that he keeps bringing to Delos, they created separate labels on all of them that show over the course of the different tests, the years aged that the oh. whiskey is changes. And you, you even would never pick you up see on that. It and they, they show a clip of it. It's you can't see it on even in the screen caps. Like, I don't care how big of a TV you've got and what quality you're watching this video. You're never going to be able to see that. But they took that amount of detail. And then also, as they show William William progressing in – they do the first test with him and he's very young and pretty much the William that we've seen. In the second test, they are taking Ed Harris's voice and his and they did the same line reads and they spliced them together. Oh, the I didn't sound know that's editors. how they did it. Yeah. yeah they were able yeah, to literally really cool cut out like syllables and then mix them together to where you get the transition of his voice from – the young William to later. And it's so well done. I think it's really, really great. Landry, I'm going to have you do that to our voices and you can merge them and we can just I need you to say slowly. Lawrence like Ed Harris right now. I, I, One, two, three, go. I can't. Lawrence. <laughs> I can't. I'm terrible. <laughs> I don't know that's the worst Ed Harris. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. That's all right. I'm not even going to try. Landry. So. <laughs> Landry did his Yoda impersonation. <laughs> On our Star no, Wars Yoda episode, no, came into the studio. That no, was him. That was you. Don't listen to him. All right, so mm, very good to see you again. Oh my gosh, Yoda, you're stop, here. Stop. No more Yoda. He's been hiding in the studio okay. this whole time. <laughs> um, it's a good time to um, go around and talk about what we're currently watching besides Westworld because I did just rewatch that whole th- that whole thing. So what in are preparation you... for the new season? What are you locked into? Besides The Bachelor, which I brought up last time, um, I have had a weird uh, experience coming back to the Survivor shows. Um, partially just like in the putting them on in the background when I'm cooking um, or doing other I things. about that show. And like I Entirely. used to watch it all the time with like my family. It, <laughs> it used to be like Wednesday nights we'd watch with my family when I was like, under the age of 10 or something like that and then i saw on hulu they had like all f- they've had, they only have 35 seasons i guess there's 40 seasons now so i've been like kind of just watching those so i was like this is like mildly entertaining completely different than westworld but like a good show to have on in the background when you're doing other things and you know it's all about i love the good lying and backstabbing and everything else that goes on in the show so it, it's been 
entertaining for now. I'll, I'm sure I'll get into something else soon. How about you, Elizabeth? I'll also say something old because um, uh, Rick and Morty. I was just I was just on uh, in New York at an Airbnb with some friends for five days, and we just like. And all the time we had downtime, we just watched Rick and Morty. And I thought I hated this show. I refused to watch it. My husband loves it. Robbie Suave, who we work with at Reason, is always talking about it. And I, I, it reminded me of Ren and Stimpy, the 90s cartoon, which I just like thought was really gross when I was a kid. And I was like, nap, I, Rick and Morty looks like Ren and Stimpy. Hate it. <laughs> and, then, and then I watched it, and I was like, oh, my God, this is my new favorite show. I'm obsessed with it. Yeah, it's, it's so good. It's also got like an intergalactic... Uh, different space? dimensions, like also space. Yes, yeah, so there's, <laughs> there's some space happening, yeah. some sci-fi happening. So it's a good Westworld compliment kind of thing. Just because other shows take place <laughs> in space doesn't mean Westworld does. Uh, Rick and Morty. Rick and Morty is really great in the I way so. that it deals with the uh, like the idea of copying yourself and of multiple versions of yourself. Right. Actually, um, and in some ways, I think it's it's even more sophisticated about that than Westworld is. Yes. Um, I agree. Actually, it, it does it does explain more. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've been uh, playing a video game, uh, The Outer World. Worlds, which is um, published uh, by uh, which is uh, uh, by Obsidian Entertainment, um, a, one of the great uh, role playing game manufacturers of the last uh, decade or two. Um, and the Outer Worlds is really interesting because, in some ways, it's sort of a an anti corporate satire. It takes place in a uh, uh, a solar system in, that is ruled by a single kind of a government like corporation, and then every as- right and there's or, or, or a board of corporations. There's just a couple of corporations that are all part of this, and it's like here is a, a corporate owned dystopia. Except what you see in, in all of these different places that you meet, and this is a really story heavy game, is you go all these places and you meet these different factions. And in a lot of ways, all of them are trying to escape from corporate rule and are trying to f- are finding ways to express you know, sort of this is actually I have a different worldview. I have a different ideology. And and so the corporations aren't really corporations so much as just governments. They have uh, they have basically a monopoly on force, except in the one place that has like uh, staked out at, at, at itself as an outpost of basically small business that is free from big corporate inter- interference. And it's a really interesting uh, it's, it's portrayal of of what uh, corporate domination uh, would be like, um, which is uh, it, it, which is that it basically admits it's it's government, it's and it has all the problems that government has. And then what happens is that individuals um, and small bands of people get together and try and do their own thing. I've also been playing a game recently, kind of similar. Uh, it's called Overcooked Two, uh, <laughs> in which you and uh, a team that you assemble are all uh, essentially line cooks in a kitchen, solving sort of various in various uh, kitchens that are on top of volcanoes or in space, and you have to make space. all these different. Yeah, it's in space. <laughs> And uh, while it is very cute and it's all these tiny little characters that are running around and, like, chopping, like, vegetables and cooking them in pans, it may ruin my relationship with my fiancé. So if my wedding gets called off, it's because of this game. um, I'm doing live commentary for his wedding. Um, (laughs) Have you ever actually worked in a kitchen? No, and this game is just cementing the idea that I never want to. It's very intense. I believe it. I, I could barely take it in, like, four minute spans where there's no stakes other than me sitting in front of my couch. No stakes. <laughs> no st- there, there, uh, there are stakes restaurant. in the game, but they're not stakes. <laughs> it's a vegan restaurant, yeah. <laughs> so I've been playing a lot of that and uh I've because I was uh on a Westworld kick, I, I started listening to this album by this like sort of new country music singer named Orville Peck that yeah. I really like. He is sort of a he has a very low sort of classic country western baritone voice but he wears a like lone ranger mask with long fringe the entire time and a big wide hat but he has kind of that like mid 80s new wave punk kind of vibe to him did you put your snake skin boots on to listen to it i did not but i think it'll really add something to it but uh (laughs) his album pony something i really really enjoy uh so if you're feeling in a in a western mood after you watch some westworld i highly recommend it Thanks for listening. Sadly, this violent delight has come to its violent end. But that doesn't mean you can't get more from us or let us know what you think of the new season of Westworld when it premieres on March 15th. Just follow us on Twitter at Pop and Lock Pod. That's Pop, the letter N, Lock with an E, Pod. Make sure to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. 
We look forward to unraveling your favorite show or movie next time. Pop and Lock is produced by me, Landry Ayers, as a project of libertarianism.org. To learn more, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.